Well, good morning. And I'm speaking to you again from my garden where everything is blossoming in the sun and in the rain. And I trust that our souls will do the same this morning under the beautiful word of God. Do you remember last week we spoke of the difference between carrying the Holy Spirit and being carried along by the Spirit? Listen to this example from Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the desert. Now this verse describes Jesus being led by the Spirit as the fruit of him being filled with the Spirit. When we look at the original Greek word translated there as led, that word actually means to lead by taking hold of. To be filled with the Spirit is to be taken hold of by the Father. If asked why was he going into the desert, surely Jesus would have replied as he always did, I only do what I see my Father doing. The Holy Spirit leads us in ways we would never have chosen alone by ourselves. I mean, no one in their natural mind would choose to live in the desert for 40 days. This is the great difference God's Word describes between the natural man, man alone, and the man filled with the Spirit of God, man with God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says it like this, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, the things of God would sound like foolishness to our intellects. But here's the good news. We're not without his Holy Spirit this morning. I believe that whenever God's word is spoken out, the Holy Spirit, through the word, can take hold of us to lead us up into the thoughts of the Father. As Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit is present with us to lead and to guide us, to take hold of us, to carry us along into the mind of Christ, which is always the Father's thoughts. Yet that verse in Corinthians says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. What is the natural man? Well, the natural man is the man or woman limited to believing only what their natural senses tell them. What he has not seen or heard or felt, he does not believe in. He only believes in his natural experience. So if he is not experiencing the provision of God through his natural senses, then he believes he has not been provided for. We can only imagine what Jesus looked like and felt like in the natural after 40 days in the desert. I mean, to the natural man, he would not have looked anything like someone who had access to all the provision of heaven. Think what Jesus would have looked like after the Roman soldiers had finished scourging him and beating him in Pilate's palace. To the natural man, he would not have looked anything like someone who had access to all the provision of heaven. But yet, it was in moments like those when he revealed his identity most clearly, for it is in the darkness that the light is best seen. God is not asking us as believers to make our lives look in the natural like we have access to all the provision of heaven. He simply states that we have and asks us to believe that in all seasons and in all states. That's worth saying again. God's not asking us to make our lives look in the natural like we have access to all the provision of heaven. He simply states that we have and asks us to believe that in all seasons and in all states. His word plainly says that if you're a believer, you're not just a natural being, you're a spiritual being. As the apostle Peter declared, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Now our Father in heaven knows that the material things that we have need of, he knows all about them, and it is his delight to provide them for us, as Jesus said he does for the birds of the air. But he never wants us to look to what we have or what we do in this world as the source of our identity. We're not to look to perishable things, for our identity, for our identity is found in the imperishable. Men may identify us from our natural heritage, but as we've seen so often over these last few months, the calling of God in our lives, his name for us, is from before the foundation of the natural world. Our true identity in Christ as children of the King of Kings is that we are blessed of God. But that is revealed most clearly not when we look to draw our identity from the natural appearance of things, but when in fact there is no evidence in the natural that we are well provided for at all, and yet we still live believing we are. 
blessed of God. You know, in Genesis, we read the story of Joseph, the young man whose father gave him a coat of many colors. Joseph believed in his heart that he was blessed of God. God had birthed that belief in him through his word, which had come to Joseph in the form of two dreams. He was so convinced that he was special to God that his brothers, to whom spiritual things were foolishness, they scorned his beliefs and they eventually hated him for them. Do you know that if you start believing and confessing that God thinks you're special, your own brothers may turn on you. But this is the meaning of the cross. God thinks every man, woman and child on the earth is that special and priceless to him for the price he values them at is his son. When Joseph, who was a foreshadowing of Jesus, was convinced in his heart that he was special to God, he was set free from needing confirmation of that in the natural realm. When he was sold into slavery, he kept his belief that God's favor was on him. That's why he was promoted both as a slave and later as a prisoner, because his belief in the goodness of God meant that he never put his hope in men, so he never let bitterness against men take root in him. As long as our hope remains in people rather than in God, then we remain vulnerable to unforgiveness and bitterness. As long as our hope remains in people rather than in God, then we remain vulnerable to unforgiveness and bitterness. The Word of God confirms Joseph's revelation of his value to God. It never names him according to his natural circumstances. Even on the day he was sold as a slave, God's Word simply declares, the Lord was with Joseph. You know, when I read that again this week, the power of that statement hit me. I am sure there is someone listening this morning who needs to hear that on what looked to this world as the worst day of your life, the Lord was with you. Such a truth has the power to open our eyes to see that our natural circumstances are not God's view and opinion of us. Christ's death, resurrection and ascension are God's eternal declaration of our identity and worth to Him. No matter what this world does to you, only you, through unbelief, can rob yourself of living as a blessed child of God in all seasons. If you will let your mind be made new, what the Bible calls renewed by this truth, that in Christ you are the blessed of God in every season of life, then more and more, in all circumstances, you can start to lay aside the old self, that self-pitying, woe is me self, and instead you can do what the Apostle Paul told the Ephesians to do. Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul described this to the Romans as us clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am sure Jacob's heart jumped each time he saw his son Joseph wear his coat of many colors, for he was putting on his father's love. Now think of the delight of our heavenly father when we put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. But think too of what it must be like for him to see multitudes of believers continue to put on the rags of self-righteousness, to continue to think and speak of themselves as selves trying to become more like God. Only when a person stops trying to establish their own righteousness and submits to the righteousness that comes from God, can they stop living as someone trying to become with God and start living as someone being with God the new self, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You know, no matter what this world does to you, God's Spirit is always able to carry you above what they did to you. So what happened to you does not name you. In Christ, something more powerful than anything in this world happened to you. God happened to you, so let Him name you. God happened to you, so let Him name you. You know, even Joseph was able to say to his brothers who had betrayed him and sold him into slavery, what you intended for evil, God turned to the good. What a wonderful position to be in, to be so convinced of your identity as a favored child of God that you no longer need to look to this world for approval and so can forgive them all their rejection. When you know your worth to God, you will live free from the opinion of men. We are not to look to perishable things, such as our reputation before men, what we do or what we own for our identity. For our identity is found in the imperishable. 
The disciples rejoiced in the miracles they did in Jesus' name, and Jesus did too, but he cautioned them to remember one thing, that the source of the joy in their lives, their strength, should not be drawn from what they accomplish for God, but from what God has done for them. So rejoice rather, Jesus said, that your names are written in heaven. That's what God has done for us. In other words, learn to receive your identity from what he has done for you, not from what you have done for him. Name yourself after whom he declares you to be, not whom this world declares you to be. Don't draw your worth, your value, your identity from the natural realm, things you do, stuff you own, your reputation among people. But live rather from this one truth, that you are born from above and so can live from above as a child of the Spirit of God. It is as we live from this heavenly kingdom, righteousness, peace and joy in the Spirit, that the kingdom of heaven comes on the earth. His kingdom doesn't come by imposition or force. Love does not force its own way. Rather, his kingdom comes through the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control of those living by the life of the Spirit. Now you might say to me, Phelan, how does this happen? How is a person born again of the Spirit? Well, when Jesus was asked that very question by Nicodemus, his answer was quite mysterious. He said, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, Nicodemus was saying in effect, what do I have to do? And Jesus was refusing in effect to point Nicodemus to his doing, but rather to the Holy Spirit's doing. Remember we saw several weeks ago that the gospel is not a message about what will be if you, but the proclamation of what is because he. What the Holy Spirit does with that proclamation is his business. Our responsibility is to preach this good news of what he has done not good advice of what you should do, because this new birth and indeed this growth in the Spirit we're talking about is all a work of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's not for me to decide who should hear these truths and who shouldn't. God's word simply tells me to go and preach the gospel to all creation, all creatures. His word also tells me that it is his desire that none should perish. That means that the Holy Spirit desires me to speak to you as if Christ died for you. He wants me to speak to you as if Christ and him crucified is sufficient for all your needs pertaining to life and godliness because he wants you to live that life, the life of being set up with God, the life lived in the irony, the peace of God in Christ. But how are you to live from there if you've never even heard of such a life? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. For he knew that the spirit of faith comes by hearing the gospel. For we have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So with confidence, I declare to you that this life is for you because I believe the Holy Spirit is powerful enough this morning to persuade you of this by doing what I cannot do. Pour into your heart the love of God as you hear the truth about God the Father reconciling you to himself through Christ. The Father has a name for you, a life for you. Don't name yourself after what you have or what you do in this world. For you can have the whole world and yet not have your own soul, not know your real worth, not live the supernatural life that God always had for you, a life free from fear. We're speaking this morning again about what it means to be carried by the Holy Spirit up into the mind of God, God's thoughts on you. To live in this communion of the Spirit is to live not as a self alone, but to live in the shared life of God. This is what Paul meant when he exhorted the Colossians to let their minds be renewed, to think of themselves as living from an entirely new place, a place called hidden with Christ in God. Let's talk a little bit more about this life in the Spirit this life lived from above, this life in Christ. This life God gives to those born of a spirit is his life. Do you know that his life is not a sick life? It's not a fearful life. It's not a depressed life. If you're a believer, now all those natural conditions of the body and soul may assault you from time to time. 
But the good news is not that trouble will not befall us, but that when trouble does befall us, it does not find us as a person alone, but as a person with God, who now has within them the same overcoming spirit that rose Christ from the dead. That means that as a believer, I don't have to settle for drawing my identity, my name, from the trouble that assaults my body or soul. For what happens to me is not who I am, who, who happened to me, Christ is now who I find my life in. You know, in the story of Ruth, her mother-in-law, Naomi, sees her husband and her two sons die, leaving her and her son's wives destitute. She is overwhelmed with grief and at one point allows what has happened to her to name her. On returning to her hometown of Bethlehem, she tells her old neighbors to call her by a different name. She says of herself that she should no longer be called Naomi, which means my delight, but wants now to be called Mara, which means bitterness. She is naming herself after what happened to her. I'm saying this morning that the Holy Spirit comes to lead us, to carry us upward in Christ, to live from a name that has overcome this world. As Jesus told his disciples, this does not mean that the tragedies and the griefs of this world will not befall you. In this world, you will have trouble, but we can be of good cheer because the Holy Spirit is always leading us into the truth that our true name, our identity, our life is not from below, but from above. And this life from above overcomes this world. Now, when this truth is proclaimed to people, that they do not have to live and die alone as mere natural men, but because of Christ can now be born again of the Spirit of God and live in the communion of God's shared life, live knowing God, live in what Jesus called eternal life. The Spirit, through this good news, this gospel, is able to take hold of people and carry them up into God's mind in them. Now, if the proclamation of this good news, this gospel, is the means by which the Holy Spirit takes hold of people to lead them into this overcoming life of Christ, a life that is content in all seasons, can you see how important it is for us to be always hearing this gospel again and again, that we may be continually drawing our identity from above and not below? Think of just how many times the world around you wants to label you wants to give you a label. Every time you go to the doctor, every time you go to your workplace, every time you walk into a family situation, everybody wants to label you. You know, the renewal of our minds, this metanoia, this repentance, the New Testament calls a growing up into Christ, a growing up into His name. Just as we saw two weeks ago, that Jesus had to grow in the revelation of his own identity, so too each of us have to be rooted and grounded in our identity in Christ. Let me say it like this, to live the Spirit-filled life, a life in the Spirit, is to be rooted and grounded in heaven, not on the earth. And the more the church grows in this life, the more the kingdom of heaven is established on the earth. This has always been the will of the Father. That's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, let thy will be done, let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. His kingdom comes on the earth as men and women are born from above and grow to live from above through the preaching of the living and enduring word of God, Christ. If Sunday by Sunday for years, you're sitting under messages of advice on how you can be a better Christian, then you have not been sitting under the preaching of Christ, but the preaching of you. How can you put on the new self, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth, when you're being continually handed the old self to put on? So what I'm saying this morning is that if we do not let the Spirit of God carry us up into the mind of Christ, then we are not being rooted and grounded in the heavenly life. If we do not grow up in our heavenly name, accepted in the Beloved, a righteous in Christ, then we will let the things that have happened to us in the natural <laughs> And if you look at the church today, she appears to the world divided into different names. The natural man will either draw his name from his triumphs or his defeats, whereas God's will is that we draw our name from him. You don't have to accept the name people give you. You don't have to name yourself after your experience in this natural world. Only an orphan names themselves. And if you don't take the name God gives you, my beloved, the apple of my eye, the treasure set before me, then you will live as an orphan, having cut yourself off from the life that goes with the name he gives us, the name of Christ. Jesus told his disciples, 
I will not leave you orphans. I will send you the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who carries our thinking and our living up into the name of Christ. I thank God for my natural family that I was born into, parents who feared God and brought me up to revere God. But my hope is not in Doherty, it is in Christ. Doherty in me is not my hope of glory, doxa, the view and opinion of God. Christ in me is my hope of glory. So when sickness or fear or depression assail me, body and soul, I can refuse to live looking at the snake bites that I have received in this world. And like the children of God bitten by snakes in the desert, I can allow the Holy Spirit to lift my eyes to the snake on the pole and keep them there. I can live from the revelation always before me that my sin was put on that cross and all the curse of sin fell on Jesus, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon me, that I might receive the promise of the Spirit, union with God's Spirit. Now knowing that, knowing my name is overcomer in Christ, more than a conqueror in Christ, I cannot just lie down every time a sickness of mind or body from this world falls on me and say, well, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. This must just be the will of God for me. No, instead I can resist what is coming to kill, steal and destroy my life, knowing that Christ came that I might live his life. And his life is not a life free from trouble, but it is a life that overcomes trouble. I can resist the one who comes to kill, steal and destroy my health and my life, knowing with certainty that God is not the one who comes to kill, steal and destroy, but the one who came that I might have life and have it to the full. And also knowing that Jesus instructed me to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now the last time I checked, there was no sickness or fear or depression in heaven. And so I can believe with confidence that when such trouble befalls me, it is not sent from heaven, because his kingdom is not a kingdom of sickness, fear, or depression, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So knowing this, I can start to sing right there in the desert place, right there in my place of confinement, of the victory that is already mine. And that song of victory is like a light that repels the darkness. That song is the sound of heaven, and in spiritual terms, it's like thunder. It has the power to shake every wall that seeks to separate me from the freedom that Christ's life brings. This is the song that the Spirit would teach the church to sing in her present confinement. We are speaking of spiritual realities this morning, and this is why we have been given the Holy Spirit, that we would see what the Spirit sees. And what the Spirit sees is that Christ has totally defeated the enemy. The kingdom of heaven has come to earth and walking on the earth today is an entirely new creation, the Church of Jesus Christ, a new species of man who is no longer apart from God, but one with him in Christ. Now, everything I've just said is total foolishness to the natural mind, to the mind alone. But I say it confidence that the Holy Spirit is present in this moment, in the proclamation of these truths, to take hold of people and lead them up into the thoughts of God on them. What a person is able to see all depends on their perspective. The higher you rise, the further you can see. The Spirit wants to raise your vision high enough to see past all that you have done and all that this world has done to you, to see the Father's purpose and grace, His name for you, given in Christ from before the foundation of the world. If you're a believer this morning, then despite the very ordinary appearance of your natural life to this world, the reality of the spiritual realm is that you can live a life overcoming everything that happens to you in this world because you have been raised up with Christ and you have been ascended with him to sit with him in the heavenly realms. You may feel by your natural senses incomplete and lacking in so much in the natural realm, but in the realm of the spirit, you are complete in him. You have already been granted by his divine power all things pertaining to life and godliness not some things, all things. You have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, and you have already been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now I know your natural senses may argue against that and say in effect, listen, that all sounds very well, Phelan, but as far as I can see, I'm just flesh and blood. I have good news for you. The Holy Spirit has given that you can see much further than as far as you can see. Keep hearing this gospel 
and you will begin to see as far as God can see. And to begin to see as He sees is to begin to live as He sees you to be with Him. Keep hearing this gospel and you will begin to see as far as God can see. And to begin to see as He sees is to begin to live as He sees you to be with Him. Take it as an honor that in your natural appearance there is nothing to recommend you as being born of the Spirit of God because we can say the same about Jesus. As a man, there was nothing in his natural appearance that made him stand out. Why do you think they paid Judas to point Jesus out? Because he looked just like everyone else. The Holy Spirit is given that we may see as God sees and hear is what God sees. He sees that he has not withheld himself from us. He sees that in having him, we already have all we will ever need. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the desert. To be led by the Spirit is to be taken hold of by the Spirit, and He always takes hold of us to lead us upward into the thoughts of God, which the Bible tells us are far above our natural thoughts, as the heavens are above the earth. To the natural mind, deserts and barren places are to be avoided, but so often in Scripture, we see God's people emerge from the desert, from the place of getting to the end of their natural resources, in the power of the Spirit. And I believe that is how the Lord intends His church to emerge from this present season of having been cut off from so many of our natural resources. In the desert, as 40 days went by, Jesus became hungry and thirsty. But being full of the Spirit, He knew who He was. He was the beloved Son of the Father, in whom the Father was well pleased and everything that the Father had was His. But in the natural realm, it appeared that He was not being provided for. The Gospel tells us that at this point, the devil came to tempt Jesus, and his line of attack was always the same. If you are the Son of God, then do something. As long as we are not rooted and grounded in who we are, sons of God, then we will spend our lives doing what we think we need to do to prove our parentage. Let me say that a different way. As long as I'm trying to be a Christian by what I do, then I have not grown up high enough to see beyond the natural appearance of my life. What the Spirit would show the church is that we are born of God, not by our works, but by His Spirit. What the Spirit would have the church to hear is the same truth that Christ heard that kept Him at rest in the desert when all hope appeared to be gone. It was the truth that He'd been hearing all of His life a truth that had rooted and established him in his heavenly identity. And it is by the proclamation of this truth into the hearts of his people that the Spirit of God always grows up God's children to become established in their heavenly identity. The Spirit says to the church, especially the church in the desert, you are my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Only in receiving this name do you find the power in this name to resist every name this world would try and label you with. As long as you continue to try and establish your own righteousness, you cannot submit to the righteousness of God. As long as you're trying in your natural strength to name yourself, you cannot live in the power of the name he gives you. The Apostle John said it like this, but as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. To live the Spirit-filled life, life in the Spirit, is to be rooted and grounded in heaven, not on the earth. And the more the church grows in this life, the more the kingdom of heaven is established on the earth. This has always been the will of the Father. As multitudes in this generation now enter into a desert experience, a place where natural resources are drying up, let those who have ears to hear hear this glorious proclamation from heaven, this glorious gospel message, that in Christ we can live on this earth in all seasons as the beloved in whom the Father is well pleased. And as we live in this name, his name, so his will is done and his kingdom comes on the earth as it is in heaven. This is our daily bread that proceeds from the mouth of our Father. It is nothing less than his eternal calling in our lives, his name for us sons of God. I pray that you would receive this word today and in eating this bread you would find his spirit taking hold of you and leading you into a strength you have never known before, the same strength that brought Jesus to the cross. The 
joy of the Lord over you. God bless you.